Well, let me add another dimension to this, which I think is actually much more crucial than we usually talk about, and that has to do with the phasing of this, or the timing of it. So, when if you imagine a small town that's going to get an increase in development, and you want to sort of manage how that development happens, if you can manage to stretch that out over a long period of time, it will happen in a very different way than if you have someone coming in, as cities often hope to do, and get a lot of activity all at once. Because as soon as you try to get a lot of activity all at once, the control factor goes way high. So if you take an area of a town that's deteriorated in downtown or dead, and now you're trying to get a developer to come in and put in mixed-use development, they will want everything to be upscale, right, so that it ensures an economic rate of return that promises they'll get out with something in their pockets, books. So they try to make sure that you don't allow diverse things to happen, but that you promote a homogeneous, upper-scale development. If, by contrast, you can take one small step towards something that then affects the next step that affects the next step, it's going to be much more likely that you get heterogeneity in the end. So the developers of big projects, these large scale, again, big site kinds of projects, they want to build the housing first so they have a population that will then support the commercial so that they'll have shoppers already to support their and you know what we want is for them to put the grocery store in first so that people who live there will have a place to buy things to eat nearby. And there's part, unless you subsidize the grocery store, nobody will do that. You have to get, you either have to make it all happen at once so that the grocery store is assured that it will have buyers, or you have to pay the grocery store to move in for the first five years, or you build the residential area without any support at all until the rest of it comes. So developers like to, if they're big enough, manage all of that. Because then they say, well, phase one is going to be you know, 10,000 units of housing, and phase two will be you know, the commercial that those people will then support. And phase three will be the movie theaters that then you know, require a larger catchment area. And, you know, they have equations for these things. So it's really like a recipe of a predetermined meal that we've already eaten before. You know, or you wouldn't know what you were doing. And developers always work on meals they've eaten before, because that's what banks want. You know, they all want the recipes that have already been established. You're going to get loans. And so the chance of doing something new is very small the larger the development gets. So if you can break it down to something that's catalytic to start with, then you're more likely to be able to allow the thing to evolve with the, you know, diversity that's already there, you know, so that different kinds of interests could come in and see how they would operate. A gallery could come in as well as a dry cleaner and a... But I think the phasing of it and the timing, um, that's typically not something cities manage well, right? They manage, they can control pieces of property, but they can't control when they turn over. But it's possible that if you manage this skeletal frame carefully, that you could move your way through the city and, in fact, spark projects along it in a sequenced way of thinking, right? So you could, in fact, manage the phasing just by how you manage to build that infrastructure. If you're intending to change the way cities are growing, the people who build them and the people who plan them will also have to change, for sure. So you, I think you're right to say that there has to be a new kind of development industry. And how do you uh, feed that process? Like, I think the question would be, how do you encourage the transformation of development industry? One way you can do that is to remove the hurdles to small-scale development that cities impose. So, for instance, the same regulatory structure applies whether you're building 600 units of housing or six units of housing. And so if you have to spend two years, and I bet in Sweden it's just as bad if not worse than here, to get through a sort of planning check for 600 units as six units, you're going to be much better off building 600. 
financially. No one would build six if they could build 600 if the process is the same, because you can amortize that cost over 100 times more places. So, so one way planning departments can respond is to change the rules for the little guys and make it so that pre-approved plans or different kinds of planning check processes or regulatory processes, I don't know what yours are, but that's one of the things that they're trying to do in different places around the United States, is to make it so there's an expedited system for the kind of development that cities want to see happen. Mixed use, small scale, uh, tied to public infrastructure, around transit nodes. So you would you assign more planning staff to those departments so their projects get through in three months instead of six months. And in different ways then you build in incentives to make this new development industry evolve to respond to the new kind of development that you want to see. It's not enough to make it happen, but it's the kind of thing you can do to help make it happen. Um, but, but I think that kind of conservative clarity is the same mentality for zoning, right? It's like, from my, you know, small window, <laughs> things look clearer this way. So just keep it this way. I know when I loan money for this, I know when I plan for this, this is going to turn out the way I can predict. And if those people run it, it will always end up being segregated uses with specialization, which doesn't yield the hybridity that you're talking about. So somebody has to step in and say, we actually have to plan our cities for the quality of life, not for how um, easy it is for the environmental planners to predict outcomes. It's important for them to be able to predict it, but they have to do, you have to start with the priority, which is to have a quality of life in the cities that is what is good for this country as a whole, the city as a whole, population.